الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا ما بعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abundantly the way Allah deserves to be praised and we ask Allah to exalt the mansion and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Brothers and sisters I am so glad to have you with me here and I would like to remind myself and you about a few things. The first of which is the great blessing of Hidayah. The blessing of being guided to the truth. And Wallahi, we have no doubt that we have been guided to the truth. Because if you doubt that you've been guided to the truth, then you are misguided. What we can be skeptical about is whether Allah accepted our deeds or not because of our sincerity, because of our issues, because of our sins, no problem. But to have doubts about whether the truth is evident or not and whether falsehood is evident or not is the exact form of deviance. And so I want to introduce this because we see in this day and time the amount of confusion that is being disseminated to the Muslims all over the world to the point that people are not sure whether they are following the truth or not. I want to reinforce and reconfirm and reaffirm and reiterate that we know exactly what the truth is and we are proud to be followers of the truth while admitting that on personal levels our shortcomings are horrible, our shortcomings are tremendous, our shortcomings are overwhelming. But that does not mean that we are ever in a state of doubt or confusion about the truth and where it lies. This book that we're covering, by Allah's grace, is one of the fundamental teachings that disseminate the truth to the average Muslim. And so instead of listening to all these different deviant preachers who are plenty that only tap you on your back and pamper you and tell you love, uh, you know, bedtime stories. Bedtime stories, it's beautiful, but that will not have you understand who Allah is in an era where people somehow don't know who Allah is at some point in time, and some of them leave Islam altogether. So the most important pillar that you hold on to, to stay firm on this religion until you meet your Lord, is knowing your Lord. I don't think anybody can argue this and I don't think it's rocket science even to a kindergarten child. Knowing Allah is the ultimate key and this book is that, that body embodiment of knowing who Allah Azza wa Jal is according to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah who are not divided into sects when it comes to their theological beliefs. They are one and that's the one that we preach if you accept it and embrace it, you are upon guidance. If you turn away from it and you criticize it, then you are upon deviance. Because what we're preaching is what the Sahaba believed. Had we been preaching what Sheikh Sukumatuku in uh, Tingi Bingi taught, then you could say, Ma'alesh, ruh ballat al bahar, you and your Sheikh. Wallahi, you have every right to dismiss us. If I put myself as the Sheikh of, of uh, any country in the world and told you, listen to my views, and my views are not in accordance with the early three generations, you should tell me, brother, please shut down your YouTube and shut down your da'wah and shut down everything and go sleep for, like the people of the cave. Like Ashab al-Kahf, don't even wake up. You have the right to do that. And Wallahi, I would. But if we're preaching what they preached, then... We have nothing to be worried about. If someone is preaching something other than that, this is when your alarm should go off and you should be alert. You will see as we go through the book, inshallah, the vast contrast, the vast contrast between what we will learn together and what uh, Western and speakers are teaching you today from bigger platforms than our humble platforms that we have. We have reached in the last session, which was session five. Today is session six, inshallah. Session six, uh, the matter of Qadr. The Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Al Islam uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, Al Imanu bil Qadr khair wa shari. To believe in uh, Qadr. Qadr is the preordainment of Allah. It is the preordainment of Allah. To believe in the good and the bad. 
هذا الركن السادس this is the sixth pillar الإيمان بالقدر خير وشره to believe in preordainment the good and the bad thereof القدر هو تقدير الله عز وجل للأشياء هو تقدير الله عز وجل للأشياء what is قدر قدر is what Allah عز وجل has destined what Allah the sublime has written for uh, for for all matters وقد كتب الله مقادير كل شيء كل شيء قبل أن يخلق السماوات والأرض بخمسين ألف سنة أن الله عز وجل the exalted had written the destiny of everything 50,000 years before he created the heavens and the earth and this is based on the hadith uh, of Abdullah ibn Amr in Sahih Muslim uh, where he said, I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say that Allah Azza wa Jal wrote the maqadir, the decree and the preordainment al-khala'iq, maqadir al-khala'iq meaning all of the creation before he created the heavens and the earth in 50,000 years. كما قال الله تعالى ألم تعلم أن الله يعلم ما في السماء والأرض إن ذلك في كتاب إن ذلك على الله يسير Do you not know? Did you not know that Allah knows whatever is in the heavens and the earth? Verily all of that is in a book and that book is اللوح المحفوظ The preserved tablet إن ذلك على الله يسير Verily that is easy for Allah وقوله خيره وشره أما وصف القدر القدر بالخير فالأمر فيه ظاهر As for describing قدر with good with the good that's that's an apparent matter that has absolutely no no confusion وأما وصف القدر بالشر As for describing preordainment as evil Pay attention now فالمراد به شر المقدور لا شر القدر الذي هو فعل الله. So here, uh, what is intended, what is intended is not شر المقدور meaning the byproduct, meaning that which is decreed and not the decree itself which is the action of Allah. So pay attention. القدر is the action of Allah. So when Allah decrees something, it is never evil, it is never bad, it is ultimately good. Al-Maqdoor, that which was preordained, that which is the result of the Qadr of Allah, may be perceived as evil or bad depending on the recipient. Not that the decree itself is evil. I hope you're following with me, if you're not, then I will explain it further because the Shaykh will break it down, but I just want to make sure that we're on the same introduction. So, uh, so the meaning of it is that the bad was ordained, not Al-Qadr, which is Allah's doing, because there's no evil in Allah's doing. All of Allah's doings are wise. كل أفعاله خير وحكمة فإن فعل الله عز وجل ليس في شر the, the action of Allah عز وجل, the doing of Allah has no evil. All of his, all of his uh, actions are, are uh, good and wise. لكن الشر في مفعولاته ومقدوراته It is evil then is only in respect to the objects of the, of the doing and the decrees. فالشر هنا باعتبار المقدور والمفعول So the evil here or the bad is attributed to the byproduct of the qadr or the object which is the result of the qadr itself. أما باعتبار الفعل فلا. As for the qadr itself as an action, then no. ولهذا قال النبي عليه الصلاة والسلام والشر ليس إليك. That's why the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to say an evil cannot be attributed to you. Evil cannot be attributed to you. And this is a very important hadith from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And it's a principle. The hadith is Sahih Muslim. It's a principle for us to understand that we never attribute evil or bad to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, this is a fine line that you need to be mindful of. فمثلا نحن نجد في المخلوقات المقدورات شرا For example, we find among uh, the decreed creations evil. 
uh, some of the things Allah created, we perceive them to be evil. فَفِيهَا الْحَيَّاتِ They are snakes. وَالْعَقَارِبِ And scorpions. وَالْسِبَاعِ And uh, uh, animals, like wild animals. وَالْأَمْرَاضِ uh, Diseases. وَالْفَقْرِ Poverty. وَالْجَدْ uh, Drought. وَمَا أَشْبَهَ ذَلِكَ And similar things. وَكُلُّ هَذِهِ بِالنِّسْبَ لِلْإِنسَانِ شَرْ All of these are considered to be evil according to men, according to humans. لِأَنَّهَا لَا تُلَائِمُهُ Because it is not compatible with him, it is not agreeable to him. وَفِيهَا أَيْضًا الْمَعَاصِي وَالْفُجُورِ وَالْكُفْرِ وَالْفُسُوقِ وَالْقَتْلِ وَغَيْرَ ذَلِكَ And in among the things Allah decreed, we find that there's sinfulness and there's abhorrent acts and there's disbelief and there's transgression and there's killing and so on and so forth. وَكُلُّ هَذِهِ شَرْ All of these are matters of evil. All of these are considered and perceived by us to be evil, all types of wickedness. لَكِنْ بِاعْتِبَارْ نِسْبَتِهَا إِلَى اللَّهِ هِيَ خَيْرٍ as for ascribing it, and when it is attributed to Allah, then we say it is ultimately good. لِأَنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ لَمْ يُقَدِّرْهَا إِلَّا لِحِكْمَةٍ بَالِغَةٍ عَظِيمَةٍ Because Allah Azza wa Jal did not decree it except for a vast and wise uh, reason. For a great wise reason. So there's, a, there's an important purpose behind it. عَرَفَهَا مَنْ عَرَفَهَا وَجَهِلَهَا مَنْ جَهِلَهَا Those who know it, know it, and those who are ignorant of it, are ignorant of it. So, when we see people say, if, you know, the, the atheists, they say if there, was, if there was a God, then why would there be all this evil? Why would children be dying in Africa from starvation? Why does God allow someone to be raped? Why does God allow someone to be killed? And so on and so forth. Look, this you cannot attribute to Allah. The people want to blame God for either being the cause behind it or for not getting involved. What they don't understand is that those are a byproduct of the free will that Allah gave us and we perceive them as evil from our perspective. In terms of when Allah decreed them based on His ultimate wisdom, Wallahi, they are good. And if anyone has an objection, then he is claiming that he knows better than Allah and if he claims that he knows better than Allah, then he is Iblis. Because what was Iblis mentality? He claimed that he knows better than Allah. How could Allah command him to prostrate to Adam when he is made of fire and Adam was made of clay? So he made that uh, uh, claim that Ana khayrun min, I am better than him. Min narin wa min teen. You created me out of fire, you created him out of, of clay. So he refused to bow to Adam, which was arrogance, thinking that he knows better than Allah. So any human being that says this and that, I, I mean a non-Muslim is expected to say that. But for the Muslim brothers and sisters, be very careful because this is, this is borderline apostasy. That you think that Allah Azza wa Jal is allowing evil and he's not getting involved or that you don't understand the wisdom behind them. Wallahi, there's a wisdom. If you know it, the people of knowledge, Wallahi, they see, they read between the lines. And I'm not even, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about like the scholars. They, they have even a greater vision. But... Any of us who has knowledge, the more knowledge you have, the more you will feel at peace with the decree of Allah. The more you would submit to Allah Azza wa Jal. So if you have a problem with the qadr of Allah, you fundamentally have a problem in your knowledge of Islam. And your knowledge of Allah that you need to work on and, and enhance and improve so that those doubts will leave you. Wallahi, whatever Allah decrees, including the riots that are happening right now in America, everything that Allah decrees is good for mankind. We're not endorsing the evil. It's a lot of evil people looting in the name of, of racism. No shame. Yeah. Human beings, I've, I've never seen shameless people in my entire life. How is this even, how can a Muslim even behave like this? Yeah, brothers and sisters. Yani, as, as many people have said, the Palestinians have been, have been killed in a similar manner for, for Allah knows how long. And it became normal to us. Now because one person was killed, which we should never approve or never agree. You go justify looting and rioting and protesting, all of which are haram in Islam. You destroy the property of another human being that Allah will ask you about on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, which is not allowed in Islam. People are actually forgetting their religious commitment and they thinking from a racial point of view. Black people are human beings Allah created like white people, like yellow people, like brown people. There is no difference between us whatsoever, except in your relationship with Allah. We are all equal. This is Islamic principles. But you cannot 
Suspend your Islam momentarily while you act on racial. In fact, those who are overdoing it, are some black people are racist against white and they don't see it. Because they've been subjugated to a lot of pain, a lot of uh, harassment, a lot of oppression, which we acknowledge, uh, acknowledge as in we know and we, we, we feel, wallahi, we feel with them. But some of them have become more racist than the white people that they are criticizing and they don't even see it, which is un-Islamic, my brother. If you are black and you hate white people for merely being white people, then you are as racist as the white person. And had you been in control, had you been the police, then you might have done the same thing to a white person because you feel that you need to get your right back that they have taken from you for hundreds of years. You're just as racist as they are. And you're just as evil. But that's not how our religion works. When does Islam control what you do? What is a Muslim? Someone who submits to Allah. Not someone who acts on emotions and anger. You watch the video of him die. Of course, it's the most painful video you can watch. But you cannot abandon your, your Islamic teachings while you act on racial uh, behavior and cooperating with everyone. Looting is one of the... Ya jama'ah, if you will, your hand should be cut off, ya sheikh, at this rate. What is going on in the world? Muslims, even in, in the decree of Allah, the true colors of people, the least we could say, if someone said, what is the wisdom? What do we get from this? This is pure evil, say, la wallah. You get to know who's truly committed to Islam and who's a funny guy. Who's the funny clown? Like Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad said, as long as everything is fine, people act normal. When there's a calamity, then the true colors show. Then you will know the believer where he belongs and the hypocrite where he belongs. And we're hearing stuff from our fellow Muslims that you will never hear. Our African, our black, I, mean, I, I use the term black, wallah, innocently. Yani. Anybody who knows me knows that my, my, my friends are from everybody. I don't care. I never look at anyone from a racial point of view. But we hear some things from our black brothers that a Muslim would never say. If you speak about it, they say you're, you're racist. If you don't speak about it, then they act insane. Somebody has to control what's going on, man. Hey, غفر الله لنا ولهم. وعلى هذا يجب أن نعرف أن الشر الذي وصف به القدر إنما هو باعتبار المقدورات والمفعولات لا باعتبار التقدير الذي هو تقدير الله وفعله. Hence, it is important that we understand that the evil which we, which is attributed to al qadr is with respect to the objects of the decree. And the doing, uh, not the qadar which Allah Azza wa Jal had decreed as a preordainment, and not the action of Allah uh, itself, which is the qadar of Allah. Those we don't consider it to be evil, nor do we attribute evil to it in any way, shape, or form. ثم علم أيضا أن هذا المفعول الذي هو شر قد يكون شرا في نفسه، لكنه خير من جهة أخرى. Also know that this evil. This evil that you, you see and recognize could be an evil in and of itself in one respect, but actually is good from a different perspective. So from one perspective, it appears to be evil, but there's another side of the coin. So one side of the coin shows you evil. On the other side of the coin, there's nothing but goodness. قال الله تعالى ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس ليذيقهم بعض الذي عملوا لعلهم يرجعون. Evil or corruption has appeared in the land, on the land and in the sea because of what the people have earned with their hands so that Allah may make them taste some of that which they have done لَعَلَّهُمْ يُرْحَمُونَ Perhaps they will attain Allah's mercy. Of course, if they change their ways and repent. The Shaykh said, النَّتِيجَةُ طَيِّبَةٌ The outcome is good or bad. If people يَرْجِعُونَ If people return to Allah, is it good or bad? It's ultimately good. وَعَلَى هَذَا فَيَكُونُ الشَّرُّ فِي هَذَا الْمَقْدُورِ شَرًّا إِضَافِيًّا so let me get the accurate translation. So this is a good result. As such, the evil attributed to the uh, objected decree here is not evil in reality since it's le it leads to a good result. يعني لا شرا حقيقيا لأن هذا ستكون نتيجته خيرا. So it is not really evil because the end result is going to be nothing but good. و والنفرض حد الزاني الله. 
I want to share something with you, brothers and sisters. In the recent time with all the uh, atrocities that Yasser Qadi is committing against the Muslims and Islam, may Allah bring him back to the truth or eliminate him and save us from his evil before he misleads the, the masses of Muslims who follow him blindly and defend him day and night. Subhanallah, every time I come across some of his new nuances and some of his new inventions and some of his new uh, craziness, Allah decrees that in the very book that we're studying, we come across something that refutes him. When I first heard him talk about the fact that you can choose any theological school, uh, Athari or, or Ash'ari or Maturidi, we came across a statement of Ibn Uthaymeen, who was his sheikh, who said that anyone who makes this division is basically deviant. And that there's no such thing as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah being of three strands. Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is of a single strand. Now recently we came across a statement he made many years ago, it turns out in 2016, about the penal code in Islam and stoning the adulterer and the adulteress as being something from medieval Islam and that we're currently looking into it to see how cool, whether it is applicable in modern, day or, uh, modern times or not. And we refuted him in the long video, which you know, I'm sure inshallah you have seen. Subhanallah, now we come across the very discussion by Shaykh bin Uthaymeen. It's the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we're learning Qadr. الله أكبر كبيرة والحمد لله كثيرة ولنفرض حد الزاني مثلا إذا كان غير محصن أن يجلد مئة جلدة ويسفر عن البلد لمدة عام Let us take as an example the punishment of the fornicator The punishment of the fornicator The difference between brother, uh, brother and sister The difference between a fornicator and an adulterer Is that a fornicator is someone who has, is not married or has not, uh, the adulterer is someone who is married currently or had been married in the past. A fornicator is someone who's never been married. So in Islam, if an, uh, an adulterer who is someone who is married or had been married, if he commits or has Ill illegal uh, sexual intercourse, and of course he either confesses or he is seen by four people and they see the act itself, then he is stoned to death in an Islamic country, not to be done by you and me, to be done by the people in charge if they are implementing this rule. And they should be implementing this rule because that's, that's, that's what the, uh, the, the entity of the government is there for to implement the, the, the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the legislation of Allah. It is not to be taken into our own hands. If they don't, that's between them and Allah. You don't sit there and make a big deal about it because that's not wise either. And that's not what the sunnah teaches for you to speak about everything that is happening or not happening. You have to know your role and you have to know your position. A lot of people think it's bravery, it's foolishness. To go against the sunnah and speak about the rulers. We've explained that but I'm just, I'm just repeating the point because it's important. So, uh, whereas a fornicator is someone who's never had, never been married. So that person doesn't get stoned to death. He gets lashed a hundred times, a hundred lashes. And then he's exiled from the country for a year. The sheikh said, inevitably, this is evil. In, uh, according to the person who, who fell into this sin, and then got lashed and then got thrown out. Because it's not suitable to him. But it is good from another angle. First of all, it is means of expiation for him. It's good for him. Because the punishment of the dunya is easier than the punishment in the life to come. Then this is good for him. وَمِنْ خَيْرِهِ أَنَّهُ رَدْعٌ لِغَيْرِهِ وَنَكَالًا لِغَيْرِهِ And from among the good is that it is means of deterring, it's deter, deter, a deterrer for others, and it is also a means of warning to others, which is one of the objectives of the penal codes, uh, which no one can deny in Islam. So it's means for the people to abstain and avoid being in this predicament. فَإِنَّ غَيْرَهُ لَوْ هَمَّ أَنْ يَزْنِي وَهُوَ يَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ سَيُفْعَلُ بِهِ مِثْلَ مَا فُعِلَ بِهَذَا لَرْتَدَعْ Because if someone else wanted to also commit fornication, then he knew that what happened to this person will also happen to him, then he will turn away from that. Then he will refrain. بَلْ قَدْ يَكُونُ خَيْرًا لَهُ هُوَ أَيْضًا But rather it may be even good for him as well. بِاعْتِبَارْ أَنَّهُ لَنْ يَعُودَ إِلَى مِثْلِ هَذَا الْعَمَلْ الَّذِي سَبَّبَ لَهُ هَذَا الشَّيْءِ And actually for the same person that was lashed, it is also good for him in a sense that he will never go back and do this again after he received the punishment. So I hope that's clear. 
So while non-Muslims say it is evil to stone someone to death, it is evil to lash someone, we say that is evil according to you as a maqdur, as for the qadr of Allah, whether universal or legislative, then it is nothing but good. Why? Because it is from Allah and you are the creation of Allah, you are not in a position to object and your mind cannot encompass it while the believer completely understands and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أما بالنسبة للأمور الكونية القدرية فهنالك شيء هنالك شيء يكون شرا باعتباره مقدورا كالمرض مثلا As for the universally decreed matters then there are things which may be considered evil when we look at them as the object which is ordained كالمرض such as illness or sickness فالإنسان إذا مرض فلا شك أن المرض شر بالنسبة له the person when he becomes sick, no doubt that sickness is evil according to him. But actually, the sickness itself has goodness for him in it. For example, among them, among the goodness for him is the expiation of sins. مَا كَفَّرَهَا الْإِسْتِغْفَارُ وَالتَّوْبَةِ uh, One of us, a person, may have a lot of sins that have not been expiated because of forgiveness and repentance. Meaning he didn't do enough forgiveness or enough repentance for these sins to be expiated. لِوُجُودِ مَانَعَ Because of some prevention. Could be that his dua is not being accepted, is because he's oppressing others. Allah alam. مَثَلًا لِعَدَمِ صِدْقِ نِيَّةِ مَعَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ Or the shaykh said, or for example, because he's not sincere. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَتَأْتِي هَذِهِ الْأَمْرَاضِ وَالْعُقُوبَاتِ فَتُكَفِرَ الذُّنُوبِ Then these illnesses and these punishments come to him so they may expiate his sins. You see the beauty? So if we're not doing enough, if we don't have enough good deeds to erase our bad deeds, or we're not repenting sincerely, or we're not uh, uh, seeking forgiveness enough, Allah Azza wa Jal might afflict us with a punishment, uh, with an accident, with a sickness, that serves as means for these sins which we failed in getting expiated on our own to become expiated via that vehicle of qadr of Allah Azza wa Jal. So in the ultimate sense it becomes what? Khair. وَمِنْ خَيْرِهِ أَنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَا يَعْرِفْ قَدْرَ نِعْمَةِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ بِالصَّحَّةِ And from among the good that comes out of this sickness is that a person does not truly appreciate the, the, the value of health the, the bounty of health that Allah Azza wa Jal has bestowed upon him. Illa idha marid, until he becomes sick. Nahnu al-an asiha. The Shaykh said, we are now healthy, alhamdulillah. Wala nadri ma qadru as-sahha. We don't really know the value of this health. Lakin idha hasal al-marad, however, if illness uh, happens and afflicts us, arafna qadru as-sahha. We will appreciate the value of this health. فَالصِّحَّةُ تَاجٌ عَلَىٰ رَؤُوسِ الْأَصِحَّاءِ لَا يَعْرِفُهَا إِلَّا الْمَرْضَىٰ Allah Akbar Health is a crown that healthy people wear on their heads and it is only recognized and known by the sick people. يعني, uh, you go visit someone in the hospital and you're walking around, mashallah, healthy and you're able to do things and you're going around doing your thing. The only, and you don't appreciate it because to you this is like normal that you're healthy. Who really observes it? The sick people in the hospital who see a person going about his business with nothing bothering him. So that's something that we can all relate to, no doubt. وَمِنْ خَيْرِهِ أَنَّهُ قَدْ يَكُونُ فِي هَذَا الْمَرَضِ أَشْيَاءَ تَقْتُلُ جَرَاثِيمَ فِي الْبَدَنِ لَا يَقْتُلُهَا إِلَّا الْمَرَضِ And from among the khair is that they could be in this illness certain uh, bacteria, certain bacteria that is only killed, that is only uh, killed in the body because of the sickness. Nothing kills it except the sickness. Certain types of diseases, microbes, bacteria, whatever that may be. بَعْضُ الْأَمْرَادِ الْمُعِينَ تَقْتُلُ هَذِهِ الْمُعَيَّنَ Certain diseases, تَقْتُلُ هَذِهِ الْجَرَثِيمِ It kills those, those diseases or those, uh, uh, this bacteria. التي في الجسد وأنت لا تدري It kills it in your body while you don't even know فالحاصل أننا نقول So the conclusion is that we will say أولا الشر الذي وصف به القدر هو شر بالنسبة لمقدور الله أما تقدير الله فكله خير So the summary we say The evil which is ascribed 
to, al to, to al qadar is with regards to the objects ordained by Allah. As for what Allah ordains, that it is all good. And the evidence is the Prophet's statement, and evil is not to be attributed to you. Thanian, and the sharr that is in the is not sharr and mahdan. Secondly, the the evil in the uh, object which was ordained is not pure evil. But this sharr can produce produce on him good or bad. Rather, that evil may result in things that are actually good. فتكون الشرية بالنسبة إليه أمرا إضافيا. So then the matter of evilness in it becomes a, a relevant matter. Uh, becomes I'm sorry a relative matter. هذا وسيتكلم المؤلف رحمه الله رحمه الله على القدر بكلام موسع أو موسع يبين درجات عند أهل السنة. That and then the Sheikh, the author رحمه الله will speak about قدر in an expansive, not expensive. Expansive way uh, and the various levels of qadr at the, according to the people of the uh, sunnah. Uh, naam. So that will come later, inshallah. قوله ومن الإيمان بالله الإيمان بما وصف به نفسه في كتابه وبما وصفه به رسوله محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. And part of the belief in Allah. Is to believe what Allah described Himself with in His book, and what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam described him with, uh, obviously in His Sunnah. Now, what's the sharh of that? قوله ومن الإيمان هنا للطبعيد. This uh, this uh, this uh, preposition min indicates when you mention a part of something. It is when you mention a part of something. لأننا ذكرنا أن الإيمان بالله يتضمن أربعة أمور. Because we have already previously mentioned that belief in Allah entails four matters: to believe الإيمان بوجوده, to believe in Allah's existence, one فرادي بربوبية, Allah's Allah's uniqueness in His lordship, وبالألوهية, Allah's uniqueness in His divine attributes in the one that that the one who deserves to be worshipped. والبالأسماء والصفات and Allah's names and attributes Allah's uniqueness in His names and attributes يعني بعض الإيمان بالله الإيمان بما وصف به نفسه meaning part of the belief in Allah is that we believe in that which Allah عز وجل described Himself with وقوله بما وصف به نفسه في كتابه ينبغي أن يقال وسمى به نفسه the Sheikh said instead of saying the Sheikh said what Allah described himself with. The Sheikh prefers we should say what Allah called himself by. لِأَنَّ الْمُؤَلِّفِ رَحِمَ اللَّهُ ذَكَرَ الصِّفَةَ فَقَدْ Because the author only mentioned what attributes. What we describe Allah with is regarding the attribute. What we call Allah by is regarding the name. And you know we have asma' wa sifat, names and attributes. Now why did the Sheikh say وَصَفَ بِهِ not سَمَّ بِهِ إِمَّا لِأَنَّهُ مَا مِنْ إِسْمٍ إِلَّا وَيَتَضَمَّنْ صِفَةً Either because there's no name except that there's an attribute behind it. أو لأن الخلاف في الأسماء خلاف ضعيف. Or because there wasn't really a major difference in the names of Allah. لم ينكره إلا غولات الجهمية والمعتزلة. Only a minority of, of transgressors and extremists among the Jahmites and the Mu'tazilites are those who denied it. فالمعتزلة يثبتون الأسماء. The Mu'tazilites, they affirm the names. والأشاعرة والماتوريدية يثبتون الأسماء and the أشعرائيات and the ماتوريدائيات they all affirm the names لكن يخالفون أهل السنة في أكثر الصفات but they go against أهل السنة in most of the attributes and pay attention oh believer when some funny guy comes today and tells you you can either be أثري or ماتوريدي or أشعري knowing that they agree with the names and they deny the attributes of Allah Someone who denies what Allah described himself with and you're going to call this Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, what did you leave? You might as well also include the Sufi who worships, who worships the dead people and you might as well uh, include the Barilvis and you include the, the uh, Tablighis and we can go on and enumerate all types of uh, deviant people, Diobandis, put them all also together. Ish hadha? People that deny the attributes of Allah. How can they be called Ahl Sunnah in any way, shape, or form? Ya Jamaat al Khair. 
فنحن الآن نقول لماذا اقتصر مؤلف على ما وصف الله به نفسه Why did the author restrict himself with that expression what Allah described himself with نقول لأحد أمرين إما لأن كل اسم يتضمن صفة صفة either because every name includes an attribute وأما لأن الخلاف في الأسماء قليل بالنسبة للمنتسبين الاسم or because the difference regarding the names is very minor in regards to those who ascribe themselves to Islam طيب جميل uh, في كتابه كتابه يعني القرآن so what Allah described himself with in his book what is intended by his book the Sheikh said is Al-Quran وسماه الله تعالى كتابا لأنه مكتوب في اللوح المحفوظ why did Allah عز وجل call it the, the kitab because it is written in the preserved tablet ومكتوب في الصحف التي بأيدي السفرة, السفرة الكرام البررة and is also written uh, in, the, in the pages carried by the noble and dutiful uh, messengers as in the angels ومكتوب كذلك بين الناس يكتبونه في المصحف and it's also written among the people in their مصحف in their basahif, which is the Quran, the book, the Quran. فهو كتاب بمعنى مكتوب. So it's called book because it is written. وأضافه الله إليه. Why did Allah Azza wa Jal attribute the book to himself? لأنه كلامه سبحانه وتعالى. Because it is the speech of Allah. Because it is the speech of Allah. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal attributed to himself. أي. Uh, where was I? نعم. فهذا القرآن كلام الله. This Quran is the speech of Allah تكلم به حقيقة Allah عز وجل in reality spoke في كل حرف من Allah in reality spoke everything in the Quran every letter of it فإن الله قد تكلم به verily because Allah عز وجل has indeed spoken spoken it everything in the Quran every letter Allah عز وجل spoke it so the Quran is not a creation of Allah as we will learn inshallah later the Quran is the Speech of Allah, so it is therefore one of his attributes. And it is not a creation of his. Jalla jalaluhu wa taqaddasat asma'uhu. Wa fi hadhi al-jumla mabahith. Al-mabahith al-awwal anna min al-imani billah al-imana bima wasafa bihi nafsi. So we have a number of discussions we need to have in regards to this. That part of the belief in Allah is believing in what Allah Azza wa Jal has described himself with. ووجه ذلك أن الإيمان بالله كما سبق يتدم يتضمن الإيمان بأسمائه وصفاته. So the the relation as we discussed earlier is that the belief in Allah Azza wa Jal, the belief the iman includes the belief of in Allah's names and attributes. فإن ذات الله تسمى فإن ذات الله تسمى بأسماء وتوصف بأوصاف. Very important. The that of Allah. Can be roughly translated as Allah's essence. Allah's essence is named with certain names and is described with certain attributes. To have an entity, to have an essence that lacks attributes and qualities is an impossible matter. It is impossible to find any essence that has absolutely no attributes. You could imagine, your mind may imagine an entity that has no uh, qualities. But imagination and assumptions, hypothetical assumptions are not like reality. أي أن المفروض ليس كالمشهود meaning that which is uh, assumed hypothetically is not like that which is observed and seen فلا يوجد في الخارج أي في الواقع المشاهد ذات ليس لها صفة أبدا you will never find in this world anything that is observed any essence that has absolutely no attributes and, and no, no, no such thing there is no such thing فالذهن قد يفرض مثلا شيء له ألف عين your brain may imagine your brain may imagine something that has a thousand eyes. And in each one thousand eyes, there's a thousand black and a thousand white of the eye. Yani the pupil and the other part of the eye. I don't know what they call it uh, medically. And that, that creation that you're imagining has a thousand leg. And in every leg, there's a thousand toes. The Shaykh, mashallah, went, went far with this. 
في كل اصبع 1000 ظفر and in every uh, uh, toe there's a thousand nails وله ملايين الشعر and he has millions of hair في كل شعرة ملايين الشعر in every hair there are millions of hair وهكذا and so, and so on and so forth يفرضه وان لم يكن له وقيه you can imagine whatever you want is this real? it doesn't have a reality لكن الشيء الواقع لا يمكن يوجد شيء بدون صفة because in reality there couldn't be anything in this world that has no attribute لهذا كان الإيمان بصفات الله من الإيمان بالله that's why belief in Allah is part belief in the attributes of Allah I apologize is part of belief in Allah let me repeat the belief in the qualities and the attributes of Allah is part of the belief in Allah لو لم يكن من صفات الله إلا إنه موجود واجب الوجود even if the only thing that we can say about that even if that was the only thing we had is that Allah's existence is necessary existence because the existence of Allah is a necessary existence and that's what everybody who every theist obviously agrees about if, if we believe that Allah exists as an essence then he must have an attribute because we've already established that there couldn't be a thing that doesn't have an attribute. There couldn't be an essence without an attribute. So if Allah exists, therefore by the logic, by the same logical uh, uh, line of thinking, then Allah Azza wa Jal must have an attribute as well. So that was the first subject. The second subject, Al-Mabhath al-Thani, Anna Sifat Allahi Azza wa Jal min al-Umur al The attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal are from the matters of the unseen. والواجب على الإنسان نحو الأمور الغيبية نحو الأمور الغيبية أن يؤمن بها على ما جاءت دون أن يرجع إلى شيء سوى النصوص يا الله يا الله make it easy for us the sheikh said and what is obligatory on the person in regards to the matters of the unseen is that he refers to the textual evidence he refers to the textual evidence without referring to anything else. You may not refer to anything else. You believe in it without referring to anything else such as your tiny little brain. So, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. How can there be Ya'juj and Ma'juj? Logically speaking, my brain doesn't allow me to believe that there's a place on earth where they haven't discovered and they haven't seen because Google Maps allows you to go to any... Ya Sheikh, Ya Sheikh, Fukkana irham abuk Fukkana. Khalas with this rhetoric already. If your brain doesn't understand it, then put your, uh, take your, uh, put your brain, brain on vacation. Put on vacation and wake up when your brain is functioning again. Your brain doesn't have to encompass it. Someone close to me shared with me recently, they discovered in some cave all types of species that they never knew existed. Yeah, there are things that your brain doesn't have to encompass anyways. You, and this is the problem with the ashaira. And this is the problem with the... They put their, their aql ahead of the naql. Their brain came before the textual evidence. So they don't look at the textual evidence independently. They have to put their brain first. Whatever agrees with the brain, they will accept. Whatever doesn't agree, they will reject. So they, they give precedence to their brain over the revelation of Allah. If that's not misguidance, I don't know what is. If you're going to make the revelation of Allah subject to your intellect, then wallahi, we have a disaster because no matter how smart you are, you're not that smart. And if that was the way Allah should be worshipped and believed in, then that would be quite odd because Allah did not create us equal in our intelligence. So how is that even possible? But if all the believers, irrespective of their IQ level and intelligence, had to believe without imposing their brain on it, we have no problem. Whether the most knowledgeable intellectual Muslim or the least knowledgeable intellectual Muslim, all of them can be on the same platform, believing in the textual evidence without their brain having to get involved. Subhanallah. Uh, noting that uh, Shaykh Rasulullah Taymiyyah mentioned that the brain has parts. In a sense that you're saying, how does that make sense? Meaning there's aspect of your brain that accepts revelation and fitra, and there's the aspect that understands other matters. Don't confuse the two. Anyways, man. So the Shaykh said clearly for his students who don't follow him anymore, but still mention his name in any given occasion, ظلما wa adwanan wa zura. He said, 
it, the, 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 the sifat of Allah are from the matters of the unseen, you believe in it as it came to you without referring to anything except textual evidence. قال الإمام أحمد إمام أحمد said لا يوصف الله لا يوصف الله إلا بما وصف به نفسه Allah Azza wa Jal may never be uh, described except with what Allah described himself with أو وصفه به رسوله or except with that which his messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم described him with لا يتجاوز القرآن والحديث he, the Quran, it should be the Quran. he should never ever transgress or bypass or, or ignore the Quran and the Hadith. يعني أننا لا نصف الله إلا بما وصف به نفسه في كتابه أو على لسان رسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Therefore, which means we don't describe Allah Azza wa Jal except with that, except with that which Allah described himself with in his book or on the tongue of his messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Do you see how beautiful it is, dear brothers and sisters? Wallahi, wallahi, it's beautiful. Wallahi, it is mercy from Allah on the hearts of the believers. Wallahi, this belief system is the most beautiful thing you can have. But aren't you sad? And don't you want to cry when you see the majority of the ummah lost? And instead of people teaching them, instead of having to wait for some miskeen like me to teach them, all these other brothers, they spent seven, eight, ten years in Medina. And they learn Aqeedah in detail. And then they go learn and they improve their knowledge. And then at the end, they preach you a watered down version of Islam, modified, changed, and, and innovated that Wallahi is disgusting and beyond disgusting to appease the non Muslims and to please every Tom, Dick, and Harry except to please Allah in the name of the religion. Wallahi, it is a shame that people learn all this and then they turn away from it and you never see them teach this anymore. Now it's all lectures about homosexuals and the gays and the uh, LGBT and how we're going to understand them and how they're going to understand us and open platform and discussing this and discussing that and removing penal codes from Islam because they're problematic and teaching innovation and, and now you can celebrate birthdays, you can celebrate anniversaries. What else did this guy leave? What else? Christmas, he said, 50 years is not going to have any, any uh, uh, religious nature. Can, you can celebrate Christmas as well. And the list goes on. Shia, our friend, this is, this, is, this is the religion that they teach you now. They learn this, and then they turn away from this, and teach you a distorted version of Islam. And people have the nerve to say, brother, why? Brother, why are you talking about the shaykh, bro bro brother? Brother, the shaykh, the shaykh. May Allah shake him, so he can wake up from his sleep and come back to the truth. Stop with this, why are you talking about the Shaykh? Who is the Shaykh anyways? Who is the Shaykh that you will not refute anybody who doesn't teach the Muslims the truth? Wallahi should be refuted even if he's the Shaykh of the Mashaykh. No one is above the Quran and the Sunnah. We don't worship human beings. We don't blindly follow human beings. No matter how much you love Abu Bakr Siddiq, anhu arda, if he came and told you something, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told you something else. By Allah, would you follow Abu Bakr or the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Wallahi, you will follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If Umar told you, who would you follow? You follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If Imam Ahmad, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, if they told you, who would you follow? We follow the Sunnah of the Sallam. Now you're following some, some funny guy who can't even, he can't even commit to the basic religious commitments in terms of everything. He, he co-lectures with women next to him. Women next to him sitting two, uh, two centimeters away. The beard is halfway gone. The, the, I don't even want to say more. This is, the, you, you can't, you feel offended that we're talking about him? Wallah, we will talk about his uncle too if we have to. Ya jama'ah, this is a matter of the deen. You will meet Allah with this. You will meet Allah with this. Nothing else will save you. Nothing else will save you. You can defend him until you die. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah, he will declare his innocence from you. Yawm Al-Yafiru Al-Maru Min Akhi, the person will run away from his brother, let alone some, some random person. And we know from the Quran, everybody will curse everybody. Yala'anu ba'duhum ba'da, they will curse each other. Had it not been for you, we would have been guided. Those people, the followers, will sit there and complain to Allah. Had it not been for those people, we would have been guided. They will tell them, we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything. You, you are the one who followed us. 
You follow him right now blindly? You, are you that blind that someone is changing his views every 15 minutes? And what he's teaching today is not what he taught in the past? Therefore, it's not the same Islam anymore? Are you that blind? Are you that much of a fanatic and a radical? That you love a personality, which, whatever that personality may be, because of its eloquence, because of its position, because of its titles, Dr. Sheikh Zangabagadutu? This is what your brain is twisted with? Credentials that everybody loves? What's the benefit of these credentials if you're teaching the opposite of these credentials? Ya Jama'ah, your loyalty and your allegiance should be to the revelation, not to any personality. If one day, if one day I say other than what I'm teaching now, not because I change the fiqh position. If one day I tell you a different aqeedah is the aqeedah, if you don't warn against me, wallahi, you're evil. If you don't tell the people that this guy has lost his marbles, he lost his plot, then you are deceiving the Muslims. You must warn against me if I lose it. Because who am I? I'm a nobody. And who is he? He's a nobody. You should commit to the revelation, not to the person who's bringing you revelation. I hope the message is clear. Anyways, with this we will conclude, inshallah. Uh, we still have a, a good six minutes uh, of Q&A. So let's, let's handle that, inshallah. Zakumullah khair. You hope that won't be backbiting? Do you know the ruling, uh, do you know the, the, the ruling of backbiting sister in Islam? Backbiting is when you speak about your fellow Muslim behind his back and that which will bother him. We agree. There are six exceptions to backbiting and refer to the book of Al-Imam Al-Nawawi, Rahimahullah. Refer to the book of Al-Imam Al-Nawawi. And I can share it with you if you want. One of them is that it is obligatory on you to warn the people about the evil a person possesses. If a person is misguided in the Muslims, it is obligatory to speak against him and that does not fall under backbiting in any way, shape or form. Otherwise, if we cannot do this, if, the pe if someone comes and gives you a twisted version of Islam and no Muslim is allowed to speak about him because of fear of backbiting, how in the world will you know what's the truth and what's the falsehood? How in the world will that happen? Do you not realize that the Prophet ﷺ at the time of Khawarij warned against the Khawarij? Did the Prophet ﷺ speak about Dhul Khuwaisira and he called them the dogs of the fire among his followers? Do you not know that among the, the, from the beginning of time, the Sahaba practiced the issue of warning against anyone that opposes the deen and they, it does not fall under backbiting? You don't have to hope it's not backbiting because if it's backbiting and I'm doing it right in front of you so, so casually, then I must be crazy and you shouldn't be learning from me. If we believe this was backbiting, but we were sitting here and enjoying it, then we must be out of our minds. By all means, this is not backbiting. And I've discussed this in my lectures, which obviously you haven't seen. I will share with you the link on the group for the lecture that explains the matter of backbiting when it comes to the people of innovation in the clearest way possible. So please understand, there are exceptions to the rule. My brothers, this is the faith. Wallahi, there are exceptions to the rule. And this is an exception. A fundamental exception that is obligatory to a degree, let alone uh, allowed. Uh, someone wrote this on YouTube. Please give some lecture on polygamy also because many non-Muslim use this as a tool to astray Muslim women. I saw a Muslim girl speaking against polygamy today on Quran and Sheikh. Uh, please visit the website once it's full of Islamophobes encouraging harshness towards our religion. Type. I have already given many talks about this issue. I, I have discussed it in a very, a, a very comprehensive lecture I gave in Malaysia. I delivered in Malaysia about the misconceptions of Islam. And one of them was uh, the elaboration on this. So inshallah, I will share the link with you accordingly. What is the ruling on doing online class? I can choose my teachers as some of my teachers are female, all non-Muslim. I don't know if this is a male or a female. What is, if, if, you're, a, if you're a male and you have a female teacher, uh, no, that's not going to fly. If you're a female and your teacher is a male, that's fine. But يعني, you should look uh, uh, to him uh, in a normal way. If you start getting funny ideas, you're not allowed to look at him anymore. Uh, can we get the PDF of the book? Yes, you can. It's, it's in the description of episode one. So go to the session one of this on my YouTube channel. In the description, we have a link for the PDF which you can download. 
Related to Qadr, some say dua changes the Qadr, some say it doesn't. Please, can you say regarding this? We will come to this later on in the book, but yes, uh, one of the things which changes the Qadr is the dua. One of the things which changes the Qadr is the dua, and that is also known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not outside the realm of Allah's knowledge, but that will be discussed thoroughly, inshallah, when we discuss the matter of Qadr in the book later on, bi idhnillah azza wa What is the ruling on saying a non-Muslim who is live? Can I say he will go to hell? No, you cannot say he will go to hell. How do you know Allah Azza wa Jal might guide him to Islam and might misguide you and, and, and make you leave Islam? You, you're not, we, nobody is in a position to say this. No one is in a position to, uh, to say this. We don't say this. We say that this person, uh, as a disbeliever, the disbelievers go to hell. What will happen to this individual? None of your business is between him and Allah. Uh, you retracted everything about Mufti Mank? No. I did not retract anything about Mufti Mank, but we got in touch with him through a middleman and we were promised that I have two reasons why I took down the video. Reason number one is that he never knew that this was going to go to the public. And I am supposed to believe my Muslim brother. He said that this was something that he did not know it was going to go public. So it's not what he's preaching. I looked at it as a sin that he committed. I still believe that it's a sin. I still believe that he lied against the religion. He claims that it's heavily edited. With all due respect, I don't believe that because I've heard it. There's no way they could have edited to make him say what he said because what he said is clear cut, straightforward. You can tell by the flow of the speech, this is what he said. So I'm going to assume that he lied against Islam, but he did so as a sin in seclusion. I'm not allowed to expose the sin of a brother. And this is important to someone who is speaking about backbiting to understand, to believe that we are sincere and we're not playing games with this matter. If I was just out there to attack everybody, I would have kept the video of Mufti Mank, even though I knew this information. When it was brought to my attention that the brother was not aware that, it will, that his, his interview will go public, so I looked at it as a sin, like I have my own sins, I don't want anyone to publicize them, therefore I don't publicize the sin of my brother. Now, if he were preaching to the audience, if he was preaching to the Muslims that being homosexual is okay, shaking hands is okay, then the video will be up. But we know that the brother is not doing that in fairness to him. Secondly, we were promised, inshallah, that he may retract or discuss this in a dedicated uh, video, hoping that it will bring about goodness for the Muslims. So we took it down, I guess, momentarily, temporarily, until we see how this uh, matter uh, develops and whether we get good news from this or not. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. My friend has claimed that the video of Yasir Qadi is morphed and dubbed, blind following at its peak. How to change the, the perception if someone has rigid allegiance towards personalities? Why? Well, I mean, give him the stock I gave. What else can we say? Wallahi, it, it, it puzzles the mind. By the way, that snippet is a part of an hour something uh, Q&A that he had. And, and the answers he gave are, are horrible, horrible, horrible. In, in the worst way I can describe. Yeah, Jama'a, how you cannot see the... Allah musta'an. Khalas, ya akhi, enough, enough. Brother, are we accountable for the things that we said? Wallahi, we would uh, thought forgiven if they don't lead to any... But What? You, we would do it if that oath was made before reaching the puberty? Whatever you did before puberty, khalas. It's gone with the wind. If you did good deeds, you will keep them. If you did bad deeds, then you're not held accountable for them, bi'idhnillah. You just said if you get funny ideas, you stop learning from him. But isn't thoughts forgiven if they don't lead to anything? What? If you get funny ideas, you stop learning from him? It's, a, it's an expression. It's, it's a sentence. Meaning if you feel that he's teaching you something wrong. Not if you get a thought. It's not thought idea. Anyways, you, you definitely threw me off right now. If we complain about one sibling or a parent to another sibling or a parent, is that considered as backbiting? Technically, yes. If that person is not able to do anything, they're not able to intervene, they're not able to advise, they're not able to fix your problem, you're just ranting and complaining, yes, it is backbiting. And you may not do it. Type. I think uh, this is sufficient for now. Uh, oh man, we got another question. If we complain about one sibling, oh no. What is the ruling? Can you please number them, Baba? Because you're just putting them one after the other, I can't keep track. What is the ruling of living in a non-Muslim country? If you're able to leave, leave. Some of the scholars deem it as obligatory to leave the non-Muslim land. And some of them say that uh, it's recommended if you're able to. 
um, you know, we felt that if we, could, if we are able to live elsewhere, we should live elsewhere. Prophet ﷺ said, I am innocent of any Muslim who lives among the mushrikeen. And you could see the outcome. Living among the disbelievers, look at what kind of Islam you preach today. Uh, Shaykh, I'm not a Shaykh. Uh, brother, wait, again we have... Oh my God, Mus'ab. Few people back in place are so into the four Imams, like which Imam you follow, Hanafi, Shafi'i, but if I say I follow Prophet, uh, salam, act, they act as if they're offended. How to answer this when people ask about which Imams to follow? We said we, the Imam's role was to guide you to the Prophet So if you receive guidance to the Prophet through someone else, why would you still follow the Imam? When the Imam's job was to connect you with him. Yani, you understand? How do, you, how do I tell this to my parents? I'm a man about my online classes with my female teachers. How you tell them? I mean, you, you have them speak to someone who's knowledgeable, let them contact me, I'll explain to them what's halal and what's haram if they don't know, so that you can, uh, you know, uh, get some help. I, can, I live in a Muslim country and I can tell there will be a lot of arguing and anger. Okay. I understand. Uh, get in touch with me privately and I'll, 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 I'll convey to them the information. Maybe Allah Azza wa Jal will guide them. Is there part of Yasir Qari is finished? There will be part two. Actually, what we did was just, was just me accepting an invitation from Brother Wasim to discuss the matter. I've been working on something bigger than that. And that was just uh, an appetizer. What's coming, inshallah, is going to show you videos of him making a claim and then he himself refuting himself. And we're just sitting there watching. And your mind will be shattered. And if anyone follows him afterwards, wallahi, it will be a disaster. Uh, what's the best way to memorize the adhkar for Imam al-Nawawi? Is that you, you, you have a, a few lines every single day. It's like any school. It's like school. Have it proportioned and, and, and divided, segmented in a way that is agreeable to you. And commit to it like you commit to brushing your teeth. Assuming that you brush your teeth. I meant that the oaths made before puberty, do we still need to do what we said? You made an oath before puberty, is it binding on you after you reach puberty? Uh-huh. Allahu A'lam. I need to double check. Allahu A'lam. It's a good question. Maybe I understood your first question uh, uh, incorrectly, so I apologize. Tayyib, Zakum Allah Khair. We'll uh, catch you. Uh, we will discuss the timing. I know the timing may not be suitable for everyone. So we will look into this and, and come back later regarding this on the group. Inshallah, Zakum Lakhir, Subhanakallah, Bihamdik, Ashadu Allah, Ilaha Illa Ant, Astaghfiruka, Wa Atubu Ilaik. Assalamu Alaikum, Rahmatullahi, Barakatuh. Thanks for watching this video. Subscribe and click on the notification bell. Like, comment, and share with friends and family.